Right, well, th thank you again, David, for that introduction. I'm going to talk tonight, I hope for you know, something like 45 minutes, um, on Yorkshire's medieval isled houses. Can everybody hear me and see the screen all right? Yeah, that looks fine, Colin. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'll take you through about sort of 25 slides. Uh, it's mainly going to be a very descriptive uh, and, and brief account uh, with some big questions at the end, um, which we'll uh, address uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so, yes, David's mentioned there are, but I'll always remember in this um, discussion that we know about these isled houses because they've been recorded. We only know about the ones which have been recorded. Um, we don't know how representative that sample of uh, houses is. Uh, so that's always a, uh, something to bear in mind when we start talking about patterns and distributions and, um, and the numbers of isled houses. So these two groups of medieval isle houses are those around the Halifax area and those around uh, in, in the Vale of York, north to south in the Vale of York. So why are these houses so important? Well, for a start, um, medieval, medieval vernacular houses uh, are um, pretty rare in the north of England. You've got to go down to the Midlands, uh, to find similar or even greater quantities of medieval peasant houses. Um, uh, but for the rest of the north of England, medieval vernacular houses are, are pretty scarce outside these two areas that we're, we're talking about tonight. So they have an importance both in terms of um, vernacular architecture studies and also as historical documents for development of uh, in, in society in the late medieval period. So we've known about these two groups for a very long time, uh, since the, the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, and uh, I worked on um, the West Yorkshire, uh, the, the Halifax area for um, uh, a few years in the late 70s, early 80s. And I was aware of the work being done in the Vale of York for isled houses there. And for 40 years, I've had this sort of nagging feeling, well, we haven't really sort of understood the relationship between these two groups. In fact, are they two groups or is it just one spread over a long area? Um, Barbara Hutton did some sort of comparison between the Vale of York houses and the, the what she called the Halifax houses in her 1973 article. Uh, but that was very early days, and um, I think there's a lot more to say, a lot more to to to, to study about the relationships. Um, so we've got to look at that uh, tonight, and what what questions arise from the form that the buildings take in the two areas, the 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 types of structural forms used, uh, and the density of of distribution. So those are some of the things we'll we'll touch upon tonight. I've been thinking about this, uh, although we've known about, I've known about this sort of something like 40 years, and it has been, if not an obsession, because if you've got an obsession, you work on it. But this, I've always had a worm in my brain for 40 years about this relationship. And about a year ago, I decided, well, OK, um, uh, I'm retired. I've got some time. Um, let's try and sort of tease out some of these questions. So I did a sort of very much a desk-based uh, research project over the, over the last winter, which resulted in uh, an article uh, published in the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal. There's a um, there's an uh, electronic version uh, available now for those members of the uh, YAJ or the YAHS as it now is. Um, and I think the the hard copy version, I think they're published in November. So I've got this article which summarised my findings and um, and the questions which I've raised. Uh, and that's sort of fairly, fairly hard read. Um, so um, it's difficult to replicate that in a in a discussion like tonight's. So um, I think if, if you're interested, 
uh, in some of the questions which we'll discuss, you can get, to, if you like, to fuller details through through reading the, the published article. What I want to do tonight is to describe the houses quite simply um, and um, to point out some of the, the salient uh, differences. Um, and at the end of the and then the end of, well at the end of the descriptive part to just sort of point out some of the questions which arise from the the patterns or the or the the evidence which has emerged um and then what i want to do is i think quite an inter really interesting aspect is talking about the process by which I have researched uh, this question and, and, the, and the writing process, because it's, uh, as I say, it's been a desk-based project in the main. Um, how can we use records, uh, which in some cases are 50 years old? So that's the scope of the talk. So let's define the me a medieval Isle house. What is it? Well, uh, there are any number of ways of defining the medieval period according to whichever discipline you're uh, considering. Um, but in terms of vernacular architecture, I think it's widely accepted, or at least in my mind is the most cogent uh, region reason for defining the, um, the medieval date is the presence of an open main room, which in Yorkshire, not in other parts of the country, is called the house body, and I'll refer to it as the house body, which is the, basically the hall of the medieval Isle House. Uh, you see, you see the um, interior of the old hall at Heckmanwike, uh, a very good example of a, a West Yorkshire version of a medieval Isle House. So not only has it an open main room, it also has a timber arcade structure between the main span and the aisle. Uh, which is the aisle there you see uh, at the the rear of the, the main photograph and you can see the timber arcade structure in the um, in the in the two photographs so that's that is what i'm saying is a medieval aisle house what is not an aisle house well this is quite a difficult question uh it's very easy uh because in both but almost throughout yorkshire uh, 17th century houses with an outshot at the rear uh, can take similar form to to an aisled house, but I'm trying to distinguish aisled houses, medieval aisled houses, from houses with an outshot, because these houses are fully storied, so in other words, there's a chamber over the house body, uh, uh, but they still retain a timber arcade structure until perhaps the late 17th century when that has been replaced by a stone wall between the main rooms at the front and uh, service rooms or small rooms uh, contained in the outshot at the rear. So um, there is scope for confusion. Um, if, if you call these post-medieval houses aisled houses, uh, we're in a lot of trouble about identifying um, what's um, the, the, the core element of the, of the medieval aisled house uh, corpus. So let's look at the two groups. Um, what do we know about them to start with, or how do we know about them? The Halifax houses, um, popularly called, have been known about really since the, um, since the late 1950s. Uh, first with sort of pioneering work by Christopher Stell with his um, University of Liverpool MA thesis and then the article in Folklife uh, in 1965. Uh, Chris uh, recorded uh, this house Broadbottom in um, Wandsworth, Mylam Royd, uh, and published it in, in his article. Um, that sort of started uh, awareness of, of this phenomenon of uh, the Halifax houses. Atkinson and McDool in their 1967 article in the Antiquaries Journal uh, broadened the subject out a little bit and discussed the houses as a group, probably about so 15, 15 houses. Uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, John Jilks from Tolson Museum in Huddersfield did a number of um, rescue recording uh, operations and um, added to the total knowledge of Isled Houses. 
there was a, a very good University of Manchester School of Architecture uh, MA thesis by Wynne Westerdale um, issued in 1983, where again he added further examples and put the put the uh, Halifax houses in a, in a broader context. And then my own work in the um, Rural Houses book in 1986 tried to place the uh, Isle Houses in the context of West Yorkshire as a whole. And we've got about 30, it's very difficult to, to get precise figures, but we've got about 30 houses, not all of them surviving, I have to say, and we'll discuss that as we go on. The Vale of York houses, well, they were they were highlighted first by Barbara Hutton in her 1973 article in, in medieval, medieval archaeology. Uh, there's a picture here of um, the state of the old cottage or the thatched cottage at Carlton Husthwaite uh, at that time. Uh, and then Barbara and Barry Harrison um, produced uh, a, a discussion of uh, Isle houses in the in, in North Yorkshire and Cleveland in their 1983 book um, illustrated here on the slide. And as well as those published works, the digital archive or, or the archive of the um, vernacular building study group uh, contains all the reports relating to Isle houses. Uh, and um, as David has said, we've now got a um, 1,900 of those records in digital form uh, available to members. Uh, so I was able to search those records uh, from the comfort of my uh, armchair up in Scotland, which is a real, um, real privilege. Um, and again, it's difficult to put numbers on things because there's so much doubt about a number of the houses, but let's say let's say there's about 50 houses in this Vale of York group. So we've got 30 around Halifax, 50 around the Vale of York, thought to be Isled houses. So what are they like? Well, let's have a look. Um, this let's go to the Vale of York houses first. Um, they are almost invariably or were timber frames. There's just one house, I think, um, in the digital uh, archive. Uh, I think one in either um, Longmaston or Topwith said to have thought to have had um, mud walls or, uh, yeah, 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 mud walls, uh, at least in part. But uh, as I say, almost invariably, they're timber framed. Pretty good scantling of tim main timbers, of posts, plates, braces. The um, infill is um, in close studying. There's very little, or well, there's no decorative framing that I'm aware of. Uh, and the studs are a little bit weedy, aren't they? Um, and we'll compare those with the uh, with the West Yorkshire examples. But um, timber framing uh, is the is the dominant uh, building material. Going inside the buildings. Um, I find uh, just two principal categories of roof. Uh, overwhelmingly dominant is the collar rafter roof or the common rafter roof illustrated on the on the left. Uh, quite slender timbers, as you'll see. Uh, that is um, almost ubiquitous within the veil itself. Uh, there are just a very few king post roofs, mainly in the west of the um, of the North Yorkshire area around sort of Nesborough, uh, and you see illustrated on the left, on the right, sorry, uh, the uh, king post roof of a house uh, in the in, in Nesborough, uh, and uh, and again a pretty good pretty good scantling for for both those uh, at least below the tie beam. Most of the, I found, I found, I think very little evidence for there being more than one aisle for these, um, one side aisle for these uh, Vale of York houses. So you're getting a, a house of a main span of rooms and an aisle at the rear, and you'll see an isometric reconstruction of the house at Carlton Hustwaite on the, on the left. Uh, but what we're also getting in 
the Vale are end aisles. Um, so not at the back of the house, but uh, at either end, or one or one or both ends. And the one at Carlton Husthwaite uh, on the left uh, has that feature. Uh, and what the houses might have looked like can be seen on the uh, right-hand uh, picture. This, I think, is not certainly an Isle House, but it gives the impression of what at the front of a, an Isle House uh, might have looked like with hipped roofs uh, rather than gabled roofs, and those hips, the hip roofs uh, continuing down over end aisles. So you get a main two, well, two full height uh, span, and then low aisles at the end. Uh, it's very difficult to say uh, because of fragmentary survival or lack of access to um, crucial evidence, how common end aisles were. Uh, but we've certainly, there's certainly, um, we can say quite confidently that they were they were a common feature. But whether all houses had them, we we can't say that. One conspicuous feature of the veil vale houses is uh, uneven uneven bay lengths. You'll see the house at Carlton Husthwaite. You, you'll understand as we go through this talk that there are some star houses that we keep on going back to because the evidence is so clear. Uh, and uh, whereas in many other cases it's not. So for illustrative purposes, we keep on going back to um, houses like the one at Carlton Husthwaite, which is on the right here. So you get... Um, Standard bay lengths over much of it, but we also get um, uh, short bays. You'll see the short bay um, just to the right of the chimney uh, on the right-hand picture. Uh, no braces up from the posts of the plate in that in that bay, but otherwise the the bays have that have that feature of posts going to the plate. So we're getting long and short bays, and you see that <coughs> also in the isometric. Uh, reconstruction or skeleton skeleton drawing on the left hand side uh, and that short bay uh, commonly uh, houses at least uh, in uh, at least presently the heating and we'll talk about that uh, a little later uh, yeah uh, the entrance position for these houses what sort of plan did they have it is I have to say the, the veil houses and I don't know the Vale houses from personal experience. Uh, I only know them from the digital records and the published accounts. But my impression is that they are much more difficult to interpret than the West Yorkshire examples, uh, because so much has changed. Uh, we'll go and, go and examine that question a little bit later. Uh, and because when they were recorded back sometimes in the 1970s, it's almost like a different era. Uh, people were not particularly interested in old buildings uh, and many, many features were obscured. So it is in many cases, it's, it's very difficult to establish with certainty what the original plan, in particular the entrance position was. However, Going through the records, it does seem that the hearth passage plan was the most common. Um, and uh, you see it, Carlton Husthwaite on the right hand side, uh, that the, the, the door uh, opens behind the chimney uh, in that short bay. There's just a suggestion in some of the houses that these medieval aisle houses had lobby entrance. Uh, lobby entrances. Now that, if if we accept that, so that's really quite a, a departure from the accepted story of uh, when the lobby entrance emerges into vernacular building, um, thought to be mainly in the from mid sixteenth century. So, are we pushing the lobby entry back into the medieval period? That's a question I think we need to. Uh, examine uh, quite closely, because I think it would change our ideas quite radically about the evolution of plan. What about heating? Well, a few of the records show that 
And a number of the houses have soot encrusted smoke blackened timbers, suggesting that there was an open hearth. Uh, and sometimes in, in some houses, that smoke blackening appears uh, right throughout the roof space rather than just being confined to a central house body. Um, I think there are three or four houses where it's claimed that uh, you know, there are, there are there's smoke blackening and therefore uh, uh, indicating the existence, former existence of an open hearth, an original open hearth. However, um, the any replacement of the open hearth or uh, as an original feature, it, the, the fire hood was the um, was the accepted. Uh, method of heating the, the central room. And here on the right hand side, you can see that uh, wonderful photograph uh, published in Barry and Barbara's book um, of the fire hood, the upper, upper part of the fire hood at the house at Carlton Husthwaite. So we're getting some open hearth houses, perhaps. Uh, and um, when the open hearth was replaced, uh, the, it was replaced in the main by a fire hood. So that's a quick trip through the Vale of York houses. Uh, turning now to the Calder Valley, the Halifax houses. Um, so some, some of the houses appear to have had stone ground floors and timber framed upper floors. The house on the left, Whitehall at Ovenden, uh, near Halifax, is said to have been um, entirely of stone, which um, we can't we can't question that anymore because it was um, demolished, I think, in the late sixties or, or early seventies. Um, but the stonework, to me, looks you know, quite convincingly seventeenth century, certainly in the uh, the right hand uh, wing. So there's just a question mark of um, uh, how much stone was used. Certainly in some houses, the ground floor was stone and the timber framing uh, on the upper floor. Uh, the style of uh, framing we can see from uh, the right-hand side uh, slide. <coughs> it's worth saying that we have to assume that these houses, with uh, the Calder Valley houses, were in the main timber framed. But in no case does uh, timber framing survive externally. Um, all the houses have been cased in stone, uh, removing external walls. But we, we can demonstrate the former existence of, of posts buried in the 17th century stone walls, <coughs> but nowhere can we find uh, external timber framing uh, surviving today. But what we can see is the style of framing, which uh, is likely to have been used um, in external walls by the nature of internal uh, trusses. And here you see the, um, the um, house body at um, uh, Broadbottom in Mythamroyd with very heavy scantling, uh, chunky uh, close studding um, and um, uh, and uh, curved braces, long curved braces up from the post to the to the tie beam. So substantial timber framing uh, for the Calder Valley houses. Looking at their roofs, um, we get a sort of converse uh, situation compared to the, um, the, the Vale of York. The overwhelmingly dominant form in the Calder Valley houses or the Halifax houses, uh, <coughs> is the King Post roof seen here on the left at um, Bank House at Skirkut near Halifax. Uh, again, sort of heavy, heavy timber framing, but um, simple plank um, uh, King Post. No infill uh, for this uh, particular truss, which is the firewood truss, uh, but otherwise you might get V braces or A braces. Uh, but just a few of the houses have um, a collar rafter or common rafter roofs. Here's one at um, Norland near Halifax uh, with queen struts. Um, the, uh, the Atkinson McDowell article uh, from 1967 describes uh, one or two other uh, common rafter roofs. 
and indeed um, suggests that they may date to the um, early early 14th century. Um, but we'll come back to the question of dating later. <coughs> so that's the that's the converse situation which we find in the um, in the Calder Valley group uh, in terms of the roof truss types. Now the aisles. Now it's worth. Um, Talking a little bit about the left-hand slide, you, um, this is a house called Hagstocks uh, in North Aram near Halifax. It uh, no longer exists. It was demolished sometime in the middle of the 20th century, I think. Now, I've included this as being, in my in my count of aisled houses in the Halifax area, I've included this as an aisled house on no evidence apart from this photograph. The question being, in, in my mind, why would why would um, uh, a 17th century house, which uh, in the main and the in the Calder Valley, they're storied houses, um, uh, fully fully storied houses, um, uh, and a, a house body sealed over with a with a chimney uh, and a chamber over, why in the 17th century would somebody build a house like this, uh, which retains an aisled form? And I am suggesting that you can um, interpret from this survival that uh, from the photograph that this is a casing of a medieval aisled house. You can we can argue about that if you like, um, but that's my that's my opinion. I can't see why in the 17th century uh, somebody would build that sort of house unless they were retaining uh, the, um, the the form of their medieval house. So I'm counting that as a medieval aisled house with a with an aisle at the front and probably although we don't know an aisle at the back as well on the right hand side you find the more sort of common form is high bentley uh, in shelf near near halifax again uh, it's not a good good slide to illustrate the the the, the, the roof over a rear aisle because you've got this little uh, og window uh, but the, I mean, the eaves of that uh, central area come down very low and that uh, retains the form of the single rear aisle for, um, for High Bentley with cross wings uh, to either side. What we don't get a lot of evidence for, or any evidence for, I think in the Calder Valley is um, evidence for end aisles. Um, this is partly, possibly because we haven't looked for them, uh, or um, in many cases, the evidence is just gone. Um, often in the Calder Valley, especially, the evidence for Isle, an Isle house survives only in the house body. The rest has been rebuilt. So we've just lost evidence. So we don't really know about end aisles in the Calder Valley. In terms of bay lengths, whereas we found long and short bays in the uh, Vale of York, the bay lengths in um, the Calder Valley are much more uh, standardised and, and regular. Uh, here's one bay, here's another bay. Ignore this little bit for the moment, but we don't get the long and short bays, which we have in uh, seen in, in the Vale. Uh, and uh, these houses are much more, uh, much more simple in interpretation in terms of uh, the entry position, because... I can't think of a single uh, Calder Valley house which did not have and can be demonstrated to have had a hearth passage plan. And here is the, the, the same house. Um, this is a townhouse at Norland. This is the this is the rear. See the, the, the cat slide roof coming down to the rear aisle uh, and the doorway entering into a passage behind the later uh, chimney stack heating the house body. It's a very peculiar house, but it just shows the relationship of doorway uh, to fireplace position. And you've got a little fire window here, uh, lighting, lighting the fire area. So it's a half passage area, sort of full stop. Um, we've seen nothing to suggest that there's any alternatives. And that certainly continues well into the 17th century as well, as the stone casing demonstrates. What about heating? Well, we saw um, evidence for open hearth or smoke blackened timbers in the Vale houses. 
we don't or we don't get that or we haven't recognized it in the court of alley houses the ubiquitous method of heating was the fire hood uh here's the whoops sorry um here is the fire hood truss at um bank house this is bank house uh, near skirkert uh we talked about this the 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 uh, Blank like king post truss, uh, but quite a common feature, or at least remarked on in or noted in a number of houses, is a central mortise in the tie beam, which might have gone down to a stringer beam for a bracimer of a fire hood spanning the, the house body there. But there are questions about, about that. Uh, in no case does that arrangement survive. On the right-hand picture, you see Bank House, and you see uh, you know, a massive uh, Bressema spanning the main part of the room with uh, um, a, a heck um, at, at the end there. But that's a replacement fire hood. You'll see the brace going down to that post there, which is that post there. So for some reason, they have taken away the original fire hood structure and built out a bigger one, and this this has occurred in a, a number of a number of cases. For some reason, they are replacing an original firehood with a a larger one. I mean, perhaps that's it. We right? just needed a larger fireplace. Uh, but the firehood is the method of heating in these Calder Valley houses. So, just summarising quickly. Um, in terms of structure, timber framing was the most common form uh, or ubiquitous in the Vale, some evidence of stone in the Calder Valley. Uh, if you want to be picky, the, the scantling of the timbers in the Calder Valley houses is um, slightly heavier than in the Vale, particularly in the, not so much in the posts and the main, the main structural timbers, but the infill timbers. The studs are slightly slighter in the um, in the Vale houses. We've noted the existence of oh, I should have probably sort of said that quite a number of the Calder Valley houses are are double aisled houses. If I go back to oh yeah, uh, let's do this house, broad bottom. Um, it's got an aisle at the front and an aisle at the back. The double aisle houses. We don't really know which was the more common type, um, single or, or double, uh, because evidence could be lost uh, fairly easily. But at broad bottom, it survives very clearly that this was a double aisle house. Um, so yeah, I've got double aisles, single aisles, and End aisles common in the Vale, not recognised yet, um, and perhaps because it never existed in the Calder Valley area. We have different structural traditions in terms of bay lengths, fairly uniform bay lengths in the Calder Valley, but long and short bays, or at least the provision of a short bay for uh, uh, containing the main uh, arrangements for heating in the in the Vale houses. There are clear differences in the roof types in the two areas. Um, uh, just to suggest that the 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 light scantling of uh, the roofs in the Vale is that because the roof covering was thatch and therefore light, and that the uh, king post dominant in the Calder Valley. It was designed to support the heavy weight of uh, a stone slate roof. So that's that's a suggestion. Um, can't really take it any further than that at the moment. In terms of plan, a uh, hearth passage was the most common in both areas, we think. But as I say, the lobby entrance is suggested in a, a couple of the Vale houses. Uh, it, uh, it does take some believing um, and... Um, uh, we'll have to sort of think about that, as I said earlier. 
Um, and then in terms of heating, um, got evidence of open hearth houses in the Vale, but in the Calder Valley, it's it's invariably the case that heating was provided by the fire hood. You'll have seen in some of the pictures that the Calder Valley houses have cross wings, so you're getting a, a, an upper cross wing in some of the um, Calder Valley houses originally. So it's not just a linear arrangement. Um, some houses had a cross wing, a story cross wing, uh, but we have no evidence for that uh, in the Vale houses. But the Vale houses have uh, end aisles, which the Calder Valley houses appear not to have had. So there are some of the sort of broadest uh, comparisons between the two areas. Um, well, we haven't really been able to populate the map of um, uh, recorded isled houses much since the uh, since the mid 1970s, mid late 1970s. Let's say 1980. Um, Obviously, when you when you start off in vernacular buildings, you you, know, you want to record the, the the real cherries, don't you? So you you go for what looks like uh, early interesting buildings, and that's when most of these aisle houses were recorded. Uh, the map on the extreme left is Barbara and Barry's uh, distribution map of um, in their 1983 book. Uh, the central picture is uh, my distribution in 1986 and the one on the right is the comparative distribution map produced for the article in the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal uh, soon to be published um, showing the distribution areas uh, for the two groups the Vale stretching well, I don't know 30 miles north to south uh, perhaps uh, 15 or so miles east to west um, I have to confess that I made a bit of a mistake with the little circle around Halifax. It should be bigger. Um, it really, really should be in, include a, a bigger area, but certainly not as big as the um, as the Vale of York area. So you might have sort of thirty houses in the Halifax area, thirty known houses in the Halifax area, known or suspected, and you might have fifty houses in the uh, Vale of York area. But what's What's really interesting to me is that um, in the Halifax group, you might have more than one of these houses in each township. And Eric Mercer makes the point in his 1975 book that Booth Town uh, in Halifax uh, had three aisled houses within a few hundred yards of each other. Whereas in the Vale, there is never more than one house, one aisled medieval aisled house per township. There's a much thinner scatter uh, in, in the Vale. Which raises all sorts of questions about society and local economy, which we won't go into today. Let's compare one feature in a little bit more detail. And the house body is the sort of critical part, uh, especially in the Calder Valley, where that's often the only bit that survives in terms of an aisled house. The plan diagram on the right the, uh, shows two aisled houses, um, the upper and the central one. The bottom one isn't an aisled house. This is taken from um, Barbara's 1973 book. Um, so you see the house body in the centre and at the top slide, which is Carlton Husthwaite, yet again, you'll see the long and short bays. Uh, for the house body and its method of heating. Um, so the house body tended to be not, not a large room, um, not really a very impressive room. We've got no, um, no decorative timber work. It's very utilitarian, um, at least as, as, as recorded um, sometimes back in the 1970s. Um, there's only one case of a house with a plank and mountain screen, for example. The rest um, uh, was much, much simpler, simpler um, uh, internal walls. And my, my hunch is that this indicates that these houses were essentially uh, farmhouses. They're, they're the most substantial farmhouses in their township. Um, 
but they're not um, and and they're, and, they're, and they're, when you consider also the the end dials they are large houses but they're not um demonstrating any great um degree of status apart from uh, their existence and their their overall size the house body itself is quite a utilitarian room i think uh, and what we also find in the uh, veil houses is that in every case, the house body is now sealed to give a chamber over. Uh, and we'll see that there's a bit of a contrast when we come to the Calder Valley houses. So that's the house body in the Vale. We turn to the house body in the Calder Valley houses and we see something rather different. Uh, quite a good display of... Um, more elaborate timber work in terms of a plank and mountain screen. Uh, we have a, a, a dais bench here with mortises for uh, a, a screen. Um, and also, quite remarkably, oh, here's another plank and mountain screen. This is um, Bank House at Skirkut again. Quite remarkably, <coughs> a dais canopy, which we don't find in the, in the Vale Houses. Um, quite an overwhelming sort of feature. Uh, but um, with with the elaboration of the timber work, the plank and mounted screen, the dais dais bench along here, perhaps uh, it, it's it's quite close in nature to the form of the hall in contemporary gentry houses, uh, and this is suggesting to me that the, the people building these houses consider themselves at least not far short in terms of status. Uh, of the um, of the local minor gentry, uh, so these well, we can say yeoman yeoman clothiers. We we know about this in in certainly in for some for some houses, uh, and suspected in others. Um, these are people at the apex of um, of um, non gentry society, uh, and they are they are considering themselves um, to have some other sort of characteristics or style of life uh, as expressed in their buildings as the, as the local gentry. And looking at what happens to the house body, uh, we've seen that in the Vale, all the, uh, all the houses have a sealed house body, a chamber over the, the house body. In the Calder Valley houses, in many cases, or in pretty much all cases, the house body was retained as an open room. Um, okay, cased in stone. This is the old hall at Heckman White. Did a wonderful picture of the uh, of the house from the late nineteenth century from the Welcome Collection, which I stumbled across. Really delightful bit of nostalgia with the uh, with the hay and the chickens and so on. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, the casing of these Calder Valley houses uh, retained the open house body uh, in stone, mullion and transom window. And you can see that it's that the room is uh, retained as an open room because there's no chamber over, whereas the rest of the house is certainly uh, two story. And, and, and the wing, this is a timber frame wing, which always was a uh, two story uh, in the medieval period. Uh, so the open house body is retained, and not only retained, decorated and elaborated. Uh, this is the inside of the uh, old hall at Heckmanwijk, inside this room here. They're putting in a, a really nice plaster ceiling. So again, you know, this, the status of the room uh, in the medieval period is replicated in the post-medieval period by the retention of the room uh, as an open, as an open room, or at least a room sealed at tie beam level uh, and with um, decorative plaster work. And this is on the right hand side, this is High Bentley uh, shelf, uh, similar sort of scene, sealed, sealed, uh, sealed over at tie beam level, uh, but with a, a new fireplace dated 1661, I think it is. Oh, there's the fireplace uh, uh, plaster work with the date of 1661 and just for good measure, the Royal Arms. So these guys uh, uh, occupying these houses, the uh, the 
successors of the original buildings are, uh, or the orig orig original builders, uh, think of themselves in the same way, their place in local society and the, the what they do to their house body is an expression of that, of that feeling. Um, right, okay, the research process. Um, Lorraine, how are we doing for time? It's uh, 25 past eight. Okay. We're okay yet. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about the research process, because you know, if, if I've been able to do this with this project, then you know, lots of other people might be thinking that they can do the same for their own particular pet projects. Uh, I was familiar because of past work with the, um, the houses in the Calder Valley area although I did uh, use um, records from the West Yorkshire H, uh, Historic Environment Record to remind myself and refresh my memory uh, and learn new things. Um, but the main departure point for me was um, trying, to, trying to get to grips with the Houses of the Vale, uh, which, as I say, I hadn't... I think I've been to one of those Isle Houses on a field trip with uh, Barry's group 40 years ago, but, you know, that's not much to, to go on. So I had to use the published sources, which we've talked about, uh, <coughs> but also the digital archive uh, and the, um, the group's photo album, produced mainly by Lorraine, which is a hugely uh, useful... Um, uh, uh, guide uh, to sh showing what these houses were like, mainly or exclusively external photographs at the moment, but um, the digital archive tends not to have many photographs incorporated, so it's quite difficult to get a, a feel for what the buildings were like. So very kindly, the Society Archivist produced for me by searching the 1900 plus records, searching for the term aisle or aisle house or aisle barn, and he produced this, um, uh, what do you call it, a spreadsheet, uh, listing all the um, uh, records with mention of an aisle. So I, I ploughed through this, recalled the uh, each record in turn where it seemed um, a likely, uh, get a likely result, uh, and read the records um, on screen and took notes on screen. Um, so I was able to say, oh, for this one, like Porch House of North Allerton, it's post-medieval, so it's, it's probably called an Isle House because it's got a, an outshot with a timber arcade. Uh, so, you know, you can't take everything at face value if you're asking this particular question. Um, so the dig digital archive it involves going through something like 50, 50 records, taking notes, trying to look, trying to tease out the, the, the particular uh, salient features. Um, I don't want to sound critical because we're all subject to the same uh, uh, rules here. The, the the records, this record here, uh, the old cottage at Wixley, got, yeah, number 85, you see how early it was in the group's recording activity of 1974. The reports tend to be very brief. Uh, they also... Um, in the main, in, in the early period, they take you on a, on a geographical tour through the house. So they'll say you enter into the kitchen uh, and on the left is such and such and on the right is such and such. Um, and they might note a, you know, an interesting medieval feature in one room, but not relate it to the development of the house, perhaps until the very end where they say, OK, we've got these bits of medieval stuff all around. What, what does it amount to? So they are quite difficult to to use. Uh, they're also very brief. I mean, if if we if we went back now, if the group went back to the old cottage at Wixley, this is a this record is a page and a page and a third. Uh, the group will be producing a, a much much fuller record, which is much fuller drawings and photographs. Uh, so um, as I say, they, they are they are quite difficult to use, and because they're because we've got this geographical uh, approach, uh, the nature of the house, the development of the house doesn't come out 
as clearly as we like to uh, produce for uh, records produced by the group today, where it's much more based on chronology. So phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, and that makes it much easier to understand the development of the house and link all the relevant features together uh, in a discussion uh, of each phase. Um, and if one had questions, like, for example, I might say, well, what's the evidence that that floor over the house body is inserted? Um, well, the question wasn't asked at the time. And the record won't allow you to answer the question. Um, so, uh, as I say, it, 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 it is quite difficult. You, 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 the, the record raises questions, but... Uh, in many cases, fails to answer them. A lot of questions left hanging in the air. And I'm not criticising the group. Uh, that's the way we worked at that time. My own records of the same period are very much, very likely to be in the same sort of category. Uh, it's just the discipline has developed. Uh, and you will find, if you're looking at the early records, that uh, perhaps some of the questions you're asking won't be answered by uh, by the uh, by the records. So that's the sort of research process. Um, I've enjoyed it hugely. Uh, I've learned a lot about the uh, area that I didn't know a great deal about. And the big questions which the the article itself addressed addresses uh, are are these. Um, why on earth build? Isled houses. Nobody else does. Um, uh, I was thinking of a dramatic reconstruction with um, with Nat, if he's listening. Uh, he could have been a West Midland peasant questioning, because in the West Midlands, you've got, uh, as Nat's work shows, you've got a, a quite a number, a large number of medieval peasant houses, but they're not isled. And below the, below the passage, they will have a house body and buttery. So I can imagine the medieval peasant talking to his, the West Midland um, medieval peasant talking to his Yorkshire counterpart and say, well, where'd you put your service rooms then? Um, and the, and the, 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 the Calder Valley uh, yeoman would say, well, we don't, we, we use that area as a, as a workshop, as a textile workshop. We put our services in the aisle at the back. Although I don't know that for certain, but that's perhaps why the houses uh, were built with an aisle to give some displaced service accommodation. So, but where did it come from? Um, the, the gentry aren't building aisle houses. There are alternative forms of construction for uh, med medieval um, uh, yeomanry. Uh, Unisled houses, uh, crook houses are, are known, um, obviously in huge numbers in North Yorkshire. Uh, but for some reason, many uh, prominent yeomen uh, choose an isled house. Um, but we don't know a great deal about who they were. It's easy enough in the Calder Valley, where we've had an antiquarian society working for over a hundred years with good documentation showing that the builders, or at least their successors, were involved in the textile industry. So these are the yeoman clothes. But who are they in the Vale? I've suggested they might must be the, the most prominent farmers. But um, you know, that's supposition and speculation. What explains their distribution, their clustering or their scatter? Uh, well, is it anything more than just the fact that these houses have been recorded and that's the that's the scatter we're getting? Um, I don't think we're likely to find many more. So what we've got is probably the large uh, corpus of material. I don't think we'll, we'll expand the corpus, but what that represents in terms of survival, we just don't know. Why was our construction adopted? I'll just um, address that question a little bit. Uh, when were the houses built? Well, that's a really difficult one. Um, we say they're late medieval. Um, I think there are about three or four dendro, 
dates for the houses, which sort of confirms sort of 1450s, 1460s for a couple of the Calder Valley ones, a bit later for some other houses. Um, but it would be wonderful to have a little bit more detail about that because a lot of the dating is done on sort of typological development, which is always shaky. Um, so Dendro would um, would really help us a great deal about uh, pinning down uh, when these houses were built. Uh, and then finally, how reliable is our evidence for identifying the patterns? Well, that's back to back to back to whether we've got a, a representative sample or not. Um, we we'll probably never know. Uh, so, as I say, I, I've addressed those questions in the published article, but um, I've addressed the questions. I'm not saying I've given any answers. And that leaves the field very much open for uh, further research uh, and perhaps, in ideal circumstances, re-examination of some of the houses uh, to record them with, um, with the experience of um, 50 years of, of further recording. And just finally, I need to express thanks to a number of people who have been really, really helpful uh, in allowing me to put together this material. Um, first of all, David Cook, who has been fantastic support right throughout the, um, the time. David both produced the spreadsheet um, for to, to, to start my work off, and he also... Um, redrew a lot of the um, uh, images from the, the, the drawings from the uh, Hutton, Harrison and Hutton book uh, for the purpose of the article. So those drawings are now uh, much clearer uh, with a few extra details as well. So David was an absolute uh, boon to me. Uh, without him, I uh, really couldn't have, couldn't have done this. Uh, similarly, David Hunter and Rona Finlayson from the West Yorkshire Archaeology Advisory Services um, service in um, in Morley now uh, provided me with uh, copies of records from their historic environment record uh, and also hosted me on a, a brief visit to produce to to inspect some of the records there so they were they were very good in uh, enabling me to uh, just check up on a number of things and learn new things about the uh, houses in the in the West Yorkshire area. Uh, Lorraine has been a consistent support especially with the uh, provision of images from her digital archive, um, the group's digital archive. This is one of the houses she's photographed. Uh, beautiful pictures, uh, and um, you do need the photographs to get a, a good sort of idea uh, of, of these houses. It's quite difficult just dealing with um, you know, plans and, uh, and records. So um, Lorraine's pictures have been uh, very, very helpful indeed. Um, David Kant has uh, both read uh, drafts of the report and also had a very enjoyable day in the Calder Valley checking a couple of houses with him. And it's always good to talk to David uh, about the buildings of his area. Uh, and then finally, Paul Barnwell was the sternest of um, uh, readers uh, and again sort of helped me helped a great deal in getting through the different draft stages to produce the final uh, report. So with that, I think I can stop share, I think. Yeah.